Thank you so much, President Dockery, my dear friend. Uh, I remember that walk through the cemetery and the connection between Beeson Divinity School and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School is long and deep. When we started Beeson in 1988, Trinity was one of two or three schools we looked at and said, wow, they're doing something good. We want to try to do something similar. So thank you for inviting me here today. Now, this is a special day in the midst of a special week in which we celebrate the stewardship of a new beginning, the inauguration of a new president in the history of Trinity International University. And I was thinking, what, what gift could I give David Dockery to express my own um, love and appreciation for him on this special occasion? And I got to thinking, president, it's nowhere in the Bible. Uh, it's, it's not even in church history till far, far down the road. But there is another word that's both in the Bible and then especially in monastic history, abbot. An abbot is a person who presides over a monastery. I know you're not a monastery. I'm not trying to make anybody take vows of celibacy, and some of you think you already have to do poverty. Uh, <laughs> but I want to suggest that President Dockery is a kind of abbot, and so I have, I have actually made a little uh, reading here uh, from the rule of St. Benedict about what an abbot is supposed to do. I'm going to read it and give this to Dr. Dockery. The abbot must always remember what he is and remember what he is called, aware that more will be expected of a man to whom more has been entrusted. He must know what a difficult and demanding burden he has undertaken directing souls and serving a variety of temperaments, coaxing, reproving, and encouraging them as appropriate. He must so accommodate and adapt himself to each one's character and intelligence that he will not only keep the flock entrusted to his care from dwindling, but will rejoice in the increase of a good flock. And he should keep in mind that he has undertaken something really important, the care of souls for which he must give an account, that he may not plead lack of resources as an excuse. <laughs> he is to remember what is written, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added to you. President Dockery, would you come and let me present this rule of Benedict to you? Abbot Dockery. My text has already been read so beautifully. It's the last verse of 1 Corinthians 13. So faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love. Ta tria tauta, these three. These three what, though? Go to Google and uh, search Faith, Hope, and Love. You will find all kinds of things there. There's a Faith, Hope, and Love foundation that gives scholarships to seniors in high school. There's a singing group called Faith, Hope, and Love. They have over 2 million likes on Facebook. Go over to Etsy. You can find a Faith, Hope, and Love handbook, a T-shirt, a necklace, cowboy boots, and yes, uh, it's in the 100 best tattoos you can have stitched into your skin. Faith, hope, and love. But here in my text, faith, hope, and love form a conclusion to this beautiful poem that is 1 Corinthians 13. An oasis of peace in the midst of one of the most conflicted letters in the New Testament. What's the fuss all about at Corinth? Well, go to chapter 16 and work your way back to the front of the book, and you will find they're fighting about everything you can imagine. Money, theology, speaking in tongues, spiritual gifts, worship wars, women in ministry, issues of gender, homosexuality, immorality, church discipline, church leadership. Sound familiar? 
And right in the midst of this treatment comes this beautiful 1 Corinthians 13, like a bridge over troubled waters. This hymn extolling love. That's why it's so popular at weddings and funerals. But 1 Corinthians 13 is not about weddings and it's not about funerals. It is about the Christian life. It is about life in a Christian community. Gemeinsames Leben is what Bonhoeffer titled his book. We call it Life Together, which was written for a seminary community, an underground seminary community in Nazi Germany. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 is about. And Paul summarizes this in these three simple but great and complex words. Faith, hope, love. The year was 421 when St. Augustine interrupted his multi-volume, multi-decade magnum opus, The City of God to write a brief treatise, a primer on the Christian life in response to a request he had received from a young Christian named Laurentius. And he chose as his theme, faith, hope, and love. It's become a classic of Christian theology and spirituality. And from St. Augustine's reflections on faith, hope, and love, we get the tradition of the theological virtues. These three, faith, hope, and love. The theological virtues in contrast to the cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, courage, which are well known in the classical tradition. Go back to Plato and Aristotle. There's something different about faith, hope, and love. They are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They are predicated on divine grace. And they are so interlinked one with another that we encounter them again and again, this triad in the Scriptures. Augustine says there is no hope. No, no love without hope, no hope without love, and neither love nor hope without faith. They're distinguishable, but not separable. One of the places we find them brought together so beautifully is in Romans chapter 5, where Paul begins with faith. We're justified by faith, and because of that, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we rejoice in our hope the hope of sharing in the glory of God. And this hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given unto us. Faith, hope, and love. The three theological virtues. But what if we were to ask the question, what do the three theological virtues mean for a theological school? Well, I want to ask that question today and see if we can find an answer in the Holy Scriptures that will help us. So we're going to look at each one of these briefly, of course, briefly. Faith. Now, in the New Testament, faith is used in two distinctly different kinds of ways. Theologians distinguish these by talking about fides qua, that means the faith by which we believe, and fides qua, the faith that we believe. Faith by which we believe is my faith, my own faith personal faith. The faith that we believe is the content of the Christian message. Now, we evangelicals, we are big on that first kind of faith, fides qua, the faith by which we believe. We are known for our focus on this. 
my friend David Bebbington in his very famous quadrilateral defining evangelicals as cruciocentric, the cross, biblicentric, the Bible, activistic, we've got to do something, and also conversionistic, conversion. Uh, it's there in our hymns. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Or my favorite of the 8,989 hymns of Charles Wesley, And Can It Be? Died he for me who caused his pain for, for me who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Yeah, that faith by which we believe. It's our faith. It's my faith. Luther talked about Christus pro me, for me. Christus pro nobis, for us. I'll never forget the last time Dr. Carl F. H. Henry came to Beeson Divinity School to speak in chapel. It was near the end of his life. He was not able to stand anymore. He could only sit to speak. I'll never forget him sitting in our chapel in that chair and talking out of his heart. And you know what he talked about? How he found Jesus Christ. He talked about his conversion. How as a young, uh, agnostic, uh, hard-nosed journalist in Long Island, God had reached down and stopped him cold in his tracks and given him life, new life in Jesus Christ. Oh, I would say to you, don't ever get over that. That's the heart of what we are about. The New Testament speaks a lot about my faith. But it also speaks about the faith. Fides quae. Not as often, but at very pointed moments. Jude 3. We're told to contend for the faith. The faith. Not just my faith, but the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. You find this usage of faith often in the pastoral epistles. 1 Timothy 3.13, the mystery of the faith, the faith, hold it with a clean conscience and have great confidence in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Paul, at the end of his life, could look back over his ministry and he could say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. The New Testament also speaks about those who disavow the faith, who pursue a counterfeit faith. Fides quae, the faith. What is the faith? Well, it's what I would like to call the pattern of Christian truth. Set forth in God-breathed, Spirit-inspired, holy scriptures, which the Reformers talked about as the sure rule of all Christian doctrine and conduct. The faith. It's a pattern of Christian truth embedded in the Bible, coming to expression in the great classic creeds and confessions of the church beginning with that primal baptismal confession in the very early church, where a person coming out of paganism or some other way of life finds new life in Jesus Christ and identifies with the faith. The faith. It's the Trinitarian Christological faith of the early church. And it finds expression again in a new and powerful and fresh way in the Reformation in what we call the formal and material principles of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura and justification by faith alone. I realize today there, there are people in, in our evangelical world and elsewhere that want to elide over the Reformation and go back to the beauty and wonder of the early church. But we can't do that. We go through the Reformation to the early church, but not around it or over it or, or, or jumping through it. Because the Reformation is simply the affirmation of this 
faith that has been given down to us in particular controversies, in particular ways. Yaroslav Pelikan, from whom I learned so much, put it this way. If the Holy Trinity was as holy as the Trinitarian dogma taught, if original sin was as virulent as the Augustinian tradition said it was, if Christ was as necessary as the Christological dogma implied, then the only way to treat justification in a manner faithful to the Catholic tradition was to teach justification by faith. And Luther added a word in German. It's not in the Greek text, but he said we have to say this word in order to make clear what the Greek text means. Align. Faith alone. And this is the faith, the Bible says, that has been entrusted to you. You as a theological community. You are trustees of the faith. Trustees of the truth. Guard it faithfully. Nurture it carefully. And pass it on intact. Undamaged. Undiminished to the rising generation. Calvin brings these two definitions together in what I think is the paramount statement about faith in the Reformation. Faith, he said, is a firm and sure knowledge of the divine favor toward us, founded on the truth of a free promise in Christ and revealed to our minds and sealed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Faith. The second of the theological virtues is hope. Have you ever noticed in the New Testament how closely faith and hope, particularly these two, are linked together? For example, in Hebrews 11.1, 1, the most famous definition of faith in the New Testament, faith is the substance, hypostasis of things not seen, the evidence this is what faith is, of things that we hope for. These are closely interrelated. You know, Albert Einstein introduced us to a different way of thinking about space and time. Not as two sort of discrete, unrelated entities out there in the cosmos somehow, but brought together in a, in a unity so that now when we speak about this in an Einsteinian way, we talk about not space and time, but space-time. And I think we can apply that same idea to faith and hope in the New Testament. It's faith-hope. Now, faith without hope, just think about that for a moment. Faith without hope always ends in terror, in terror. You know, the devil, the, the, devil um, the devils, the demons do not hope, nor do they love, but they do believe. They have a kind of faith. James 2.19 says, the devils believe and shudder. They're terrified. They tremble. Faith without hope always ends in terror. Love without hope becomes twisted and turned in upon itself. In curvatus in se, like a spring coiled around into itself. And it will inevitably end up in narcissism. So, faith, hope, hyphenate them in the New Testament. They're distinguishable but not separable. And what is hope? Hope is not the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. That's Emily Dickinson's famous poem about hope. No. Nope. Hope is not a thing with feathers that perches in the soul. Hope, the New Testament says in Hebrews 6, 19, is an anchor in the soul. And it is hope that is linked again and again and again with that wonderful, strong, adjective, steadfast, steadfast hope. 
There's something else about hope I want to mention to you. As a theological community, this is really important. Because we hope for that which we do not yet have and see, there is this note of incompletion there. You know, when Abraham and Sarah were called by God to leave the land of their birth, Ur of the Chaldees, and go out, it says in Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham obeyed and he was called out to go to a place he did not know where he was going. Not knowing. And yet he went in faith, in hope. And even when they got to the promised land, it says, they all died in faith, not having received, not having received what was promised. There is this note of incompletion, of imperfection. Our knowledge is imperfect. Our prophecy is imperfect. And so this amazing image that Paul uses of seeing through a glass darkly or a mirror dimly, if you've ever been to Corinth, you go to the museum, and there they will show you what that actually looked like in Corinth in the first century in Paul's day. It was a piece of brass, that bronze, that had been polished. That was what a mirror was in the ancient world, and it was inevitably warped, cracked, distorted. And so he says, this is how we see. This is how we look, imperfectly, incompletely. And one of the things that he wants to emphasize to the Corinthians, and I think we need to emphasize in today's church, in today's seminary, is the danger that arises from the heresy of an overly realized eschatology. We are not there yet. We are in via. And it's there in the church, it's there in our own evangelical culture, name it and claim it. Receive it, believe it, shake it and bake it. You, you put it on any channel you want. But there's something insidious about that because it denies the theological virtue of hope. Hope is the death knell to every theological imperialism. A theological community needs to know that. Well, we come to love. We come to love because, in a way, love is the summit of all three of these theological virtues. It's the greatest. Paul said that. Whenever we talk about the love of God in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, I think we have to keep three reminders in mind. And it applies here. The first is that we must never, ever divorce the love of God from the holiness of God or the sovereignty of God. Of God. The Bible says God is love, yes, but it also says God is light. The Bible says God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 29. The fire of God's holy love that burns and consumes. We never divorce the love of God from the holiness of God and the sovereignty of God. Second point. And Paul isn't spelling all this out here in this beautiful love hymn, but he's presupposing it. The second point is that God's love is supremely displayed, supremely displayed in the cross of Jesus Christ. You want to see the love of God? Look at the cross. He's already said that in 1 Corinthians, right? I've determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ. And him crucified. Again and again, that's the theme of the New Testament, isn't it? Romans 5 eight. God commends his love toward us. Isn't that why we were yet sinners? Christ died for us. 1 John 14. Here in his love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. His initiative. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The cross. And the third point is, and this does get on to what Paul is dealing with here in 1 Corinthians 13. God's love for us elicits our love for one another. And so if a person says, I love God, hates his brother, there's a word for that kind of person, liar. That person is a liar. Their life belies their talk. And so in this whole beautiful chapter that we've heard read, 
we see love unfolded. Love at work in a Christian community. Love at work in a seminary community. Verses 1 through 3, the necessity of love. Here Paul says that love surpasses eloquence, altruism, even martyrdom if I give my body to be burned. Even faith, if I have all faith, not just a little bit, but all of it. No love, no good. The necessity of love. And then he comes to these verses that when this issue says a wedding text or a wedding sermon, are the ones that we focus on, they're beautiful. Fifteen characteristics of love in these few verses, four through seven. Patient, kind, not jealous, not boastful, not arrogant, not rude. The reality of love does not boast, does not walk about on stilts, but bears and believes and hopes. You see, he gets faith and hope in, believes and hopes and endures all things. And finally, 8 through 13, yep, that's, the, uh, that's where he talks about the permanence of love and the indefectibility of love. These three, faith, hope, and love, they remain, the three imperishables. But the greatest of these is love. You can't really have a theological community without it. I mean, you can have a group of theologians and theological students and hangers-on that meet together for study and meetings, but you can't really have what Bonhoeffer called that life together in Christ without these three theological virtues deeply woven into the texture of your life, your soul. But why is love the greatest? Well, there are many answers to that question. I'll give you three. All of them true. You know, some things you can say more than one way of saying something is true. I think all of these are true. Augustine's answer, why is love the greatest? Augustine's answer was, love is the only one of these three theological virtues that we know here in time that we shall also enjoy in eternity. He says, you know, when we have sight, we won't need hope anymore. We'll have that for which we have been hoping all these years. It'll be face to face. We won't need faith because we'll no longer be walking at a distance, but it'll be face to face, intimate, close. But love, love is the one thing you can know in this world that will keep going forever and ever and ever into infinity for all eternity. Answer number two. That's a good answer. I'm not against it. That's a good answer. Answer number two. It's because of these three theological virtues, the only one that is really divine in the sense of being God is love. God does not hope. God does not believe. But God loves. And God is love, the Scriptures say. What does this mean? I cannot do better than recommend to you Jonathan Edwards' magnificent sermon, Heaven, a World of Love. You know that sermon? Oh, go to the library and dig it out. Read it over and over again. Uh, those of you who are newly married, uh, read this to one another. That's what John Piper and his wife did when they first got married. He would read to each other out loud, Jonathan Edwards' Heaven, a World of Love, in which he describes... God is a glorious fountain with flowing streams, rivers of love and delight. And these rivers swell, as it were, into an ocean of love. And it's in that ocean that the souls of the ransomed can come and bathe with sweetest enjoyment. And their hearts, as it were, deluged by love. Well, somebody said of Richard Sibbs that heaven 
was in him before he was in heaven. Heaven was in him. He had a little of this heaven, this love of God in him before he was in heaven. And so that's the second reason why faith is the greatest, because God loves and God is love. And we are invited into that overflashing fountain of reality that knows no diminution for all eternity. But let me suggest one additional reason why love is the greatest of the three theological virtues, and maybe especially in a community like Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And that is because love is the irreducible mark of a Christian. A few years ago, uh, Dr. Woodbridge and I wrote a book together called The Mark of Jesus, Loving in a Way the World Can See. And it was really a takeoff on Francis Schaeffer, great little book called The Mark of a Christian, one of the last things he wrote before he died. It's an exposition of John 13, 34. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. How else are they going to know? They can't read your mind. They can't peer into your heart. But they can listen to your lips. They can observe your walk. They can see how you treat one another. And Jesus said, astoundingly, Francis Schaeffer put it this way, Jesus gives the world the right to decide whether or not we are truly Christians depending upon our observable love for one another. I had to read that about five or ten times before I understood what he was saying. And another five or ten before I could really believe it was true. But go back to John 13, and that's exactly what Jesus is saying. By this shall all people know you belong to me. So love is the irreducible mark of a Christian. And in a community that has as its heart the sharing of the gospel, the world missionary mandate, you've got to remember these three remain faith. Love, but the greatest of these is love. Now, the opposite of faith is not doubt. It's not even unbelief. The opposite of faith is that word Ralph Waldo Emerson used as the title of his most popular essay, self-reliance. We can make it on our own. That's the opposite of faith, not trusting in anyone but you. The opposite of hope is not despair. Sometimes despair can be spiritually innervating, the dark night of the soul. The opposite of hope is not despair. It's presumption. It's assuming and presuming upon the grace of God. The opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. It's spiritual apathy and unconcern. As you cultivate these three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, may God deliver you from self-reliance and presumption and spiritual apathy and indifference. And if you have this kind of community about you, you know what you're going to look like? You're going to be a community that is marked by humility. It's not one of the three theological virtues, but you see it shining through all of them. Humility. I love this story. I want to close with it. Uh, It's a story about a birthday celebration when Karl Barth turned 80 years old, and his students came from all over the world, and they came to Basel and talked about the grand old master of theology and the wonderful things he had written, what a great, great soul he was, da 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 and Then they asked him to respond. This is what he got up and said. If I have done anything in this long life of mine, I have done it as a relative of the donkey that went its way carrying an important burden. The disciples had said to its owner, The Lord has need of it. And so it seems to have pleased God to have used me at this time. I was permitted to be the donkey that carried 
this better theology for part of the way or tried to carry it as best I could. Abbot Dockery, Donkey David, <laughs> Donkey Timothy, Donkey faculty and students. We're a company of donkeys. And our job is to carry that most precious cargo all the way to Calvary and all the way to victory and to do it with faith and with hope and with love. May God bless you.